This episode of Author Stories is brought to you by the Writing Mastery Academy. Founded by Jessica Brody, author of the best-selling plotting guide, Save the Cat Writes a Novel. The Writing Mastery Academy features online, on-demand writing courses, including the official Save the Cat Writes a Novel companion course. Novel fast drafting, crafting dynamic characters, and productivity hacks for writers to name just a few, plus monthly live webinars on various writing topics. Go to jessicabrody.com slash hank to learn more and get your first month of unlimited access to all the content for just $6. That's right, just $6. jessicabrody.com slash hank. You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wine, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, JT Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanderson, Robin Mom, Ernest Klein, Jim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm really excited to have Mark Sullivan back on the show with me. It's been uh, a little while since he was on, about about three or four years, I think. Um, he, uh, he previously had a book called Beneath a Scarlet Sky, which was an amazing book, and uh, and we talked all about it last time. I'm going to put a link to that show in the show notes if if anybody wants to go and catch up on what we talked about last time but mark returns to the show today to talk about an amazing new book called the last green valley and man I, i'll tell you what mark this book just rocked my world in 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 so many different ways what what a fantastic book um, i'm recommending it to everyone uh this spring so i'm excited to talk about it today welcome back to the show well thanks for having me hank and thanks for the kind words about last green valley it's it's definitely been another labor of love, and I'm really glad at the reaction people are uh, giving me after having read it, especially during the pandemic. Absolutely, you know, um, you know. Hopefully, now that we're we're in, you know, into spring of 2021, and that that blight on society that was 2020 is yeah. hopefully in the past, and we're we're coming out of it a little bit. So we're looking for any glimmers of hope you know to, to hold on to and yeah. um you know that the last green valley is 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 kind of that you know has been that thing for me that um you know what a what a dark tale in a lot of ways but uh you know there i, I just always held on to that glimmer of hope that i knew that you were going to sow into the story yeah and it's there i mean the the martells the uh, people the book is based on um are amazing people because they do go through this dark, brutal journey trying to get the freedom. In fact, their whole life before they even start trying is is just tough and brutal. And yet they hold on to faith and hope. And because of that, they're able to overcome and survive one of the more extraordinary journeys I've ever heard of. Uh, when I heard it, I was instantly inspired. Um, you know, a lot of people said that I would never find another story like uh, Beneath a Scarlet Sky. And I said, you know, I, I think I will. And I was right. I started getting all these story ideas thrown at me, emails and through my website. And some of them were really good. And I realized very quickly I had to have some kind of criteria which story was going to uh, do next. And it occurred to me very quickly that the reason that Beneath the Scarlet Sky had touched so many people around the world is that the story was inherently moving, inspiring, healing in ways, and potentially transformative to the reader. And so that was my filter, those four words. And I looked and looked, and again, they came so close, but they weren't quite there until November of 2017, after I gave a presentation here in Bozeman at the local Rotary Club uh, where I live, um, a retired dentist came up to me after my presentation and said, have you heard the story of the Martells? And I said, you mean like the construction people? Um, they own a big construction company here. 
And he said, yeah, the whole time I read Beneath the Scarlet Sky, all I could think of was the story of how they came to America. And so he said, you really need to hear it. And so a couple of days later, I uh, put Bill Martell's address in my navigator, and it was like two miles from my house, which was good. And then it told me to take a left in this older neighborhood, and I got an odd feeling, and I couldn't quite figure it out until I got to Bill's driveway. And I realized I couldn't be 200, 250 yards from where I heard the story of Pino Lella, which formed the basis of Beneath the Scarlet Sky. And I was stunned at that. And I knocked on the door and Bill's a great guy. And we start talking. And within 10 minutes of him starting to tell the story of his parents, I'm sitting forward. And within an hour, I know I'm writing it because I can oh, yeah. feel it, all those traits. and. Uh, yeah, it, it was an amazing journey researching it and writing it. And I'm I'm just thrilled that people are reacting the way they are. You know, there there are um you know, writers get ideas from all over the place. You know, that you just never know where a spark of inspiration is gonna come from and, and what kicks off that that what if thing that starts running through your brain and, and you know where where stories are formed. But yeah. then there's there are those moments where you feel it in your bones uh, mm -hmm. almost like like it just it starts vibrating inside you and, and you know this this is the story idea you know not just a good story idea this is one that has to be written sure and and that is exactly the feeling it makes you feel antsy it yeah makes you want to put it down on paper so mark let's recap for listeners for just a minute um you have written quite a number of of thriller novels and and had a you know a, a great career as a as a thriller writer and then uh something happens with the uh, the story for beneath the scarlet sky and you you shift gears a little bit and you write the story and all of a sudden your writing career changes and and you uh you look at mark sullivan the writer in in a different light um what was it that precipitated this this change in direction for you well pino's story was different i mean it had thrilling aspects to it beneath the scarlet sky um but there was so much more there were other dimensions and i really had to become a different kind of writer to pull it off um i had to stop writing with my head i mean thrillers and mysteries suspense stories are largely intellectual games um, at, at times, they, of course, they can transcend it, but they're mostly written with your head. And to write Beneath the Scarlet Sky required me to move my center of attention to my heart so that I could understand what had happened to that guy, you know, in those two years at the end of World War II. And um, it really pushed me out of my comfort zone. It demanded that I write outside my normal envelope. I mean, way outside my normal envelope. And it totally changed me as a writer and what I wanted to write about, because I realized that um, it's kind of easy to write a dark story. It's more difficult to write a story that begins dark and ends with a triumph. And uh, that was the challenge of Beneath the Scarlet Sky. And it was definitely the challenge of The Last Green Valley. How was I going to get inside not only the character's head, but their hearts so that the reader felt like they were right there on the journey with the Martells? And um, this kind of writing I found is the most fulfilling I've ever done because I think people are desperately hungry for stories of triumph ultimately of triumph, even if there's deep tragedy involved. They want to believe that people can come out the other side of a crucible and triumph. Well, Mark, over the last uh, several years, we have seen uh, historical fiction specifically based around World War II or this this you know early to mid 20th century mm -hmm. um, that that this uh, this topic, this time period is uh, just seems to be such fertile ground for for writers right now and that and we, we see writers exploring all all sorts of angles of, of covering um, 
uh, this topic in this time period. And I've often wondered um, with guests a lot of times, you know, what is it about this time period that that we just seem to have an insatiable hunger for right now? And and I, I, I my personal idea is that, you know, we we we're losing a lot of these people from this time period. Um, um, you know, my grandparents who had served in world war two and uncles and things like that, you know, have, uh, have died and, and, you know, gone on to the, to their next adventure. And, uh, you know, we're left with, with stories and we're, we're losing the people that inhabit those stories. Is that one, one thing that makes these stories so fascinating is that we, we run the chance of losing these stories? It certainly is for me. Uh, I realized when I started working on Pino Alla's story that he was 78 at the time, and I didn't get it published until he was 88, uh, 89. And um, the entire time I knew there was a clock ticking because I wanted to finish the book so he would get the recognition he so richly deserved. But I think you're right. These stories disappear. I think I read somewhere roughly 6,000 World War II veterans a day die. Um, my own father-in-law is a vet of World War II, and he's 97, mm. still sharp, still can tell his stories. Um, but we lose those stories day after day after day. And it's hard to grasp. You know, I think it was probably hard to grasp for people before the pandemic what it was like to be in a conflict that was global, largely. And it was a challenge that was global. And it took everybody sacrificing and everybody being selfless to defeat, you know, this darkness that attempted to take over the world. And I think we're fascinated by that still, because ordinary people across a huge spectrum of society, stood up and fought for what was right. And I think that story it never gets old, ever. And I think that's why we're fascinated with it. Absolutely. I, I think that's as well put as, as I've heard it from anyone. Um, Mark, um, Amazon lists The Last Green Valley as uh, – it, it puts it in the category of biographical fiction. Uh -huh. uh, or What do you think about that description? I think it's apt, you know, I've also, it's, they also have it categorized as a literary novel, which I think sure. is also apt. Um, you know, it, the thing is, is I didn't have uh, Adeline and Emil to interview at length. I had their sons who were quite young during the journey, but they had vivid memories. And I had uh, recorded interviews of Emil and Adeline done by uh, their granddaughter, uh, and there were also some articles written about them years ago in the Montana newspapers. Um, but there was certain questions that the sons couldn't answer and that weren't answered in um, those recordings and in those articles. So, for example, everybody uh, who knew Emil prior to uh, the, this journey described him as the kind of guy who tried not to get noticed. He had been raised under communism and Stalinism and understood that if you were someone who stood out, who was excellent at doing something, you were probably going to end up murdered or put in the gulag. Um, and that happened to his father, who did come back, but a broken man. And it happened to Adeline's father, who uh, was taken, sent to Siberia and never heard from again. So Emil is this kind of guy who keeps his head down. He doesn't aspire to anything other than freedom. And he gets, he and Adeline get separated at a certain part of the story, and he gets sent to a Soviet prison camp. And before he goes into the prison camp, as I just described, he's almost like a passive character. And something happens to him in that camp. And the camp for those of you who haven't read the book, is brutal. Um, 2,300 men go in, and by the time Emil Martel makes his incredible escape, there are about 200 left, 199, 200 left. And they're all dying of, mostly of um, various diseases that are spreading like wildfire in the camp, and the Soviets can't stop it. Um, but 
certainly after he comes out of the camp and during his escape, I mean, he almost starts acting like James Bond, right? He's jumping trains, changing clothes, hiding in the woods. He's doing everything he can to get back to try to find his family who are, you know, over 15, 1800 miles away uh, on the other side of an occupied territory. So, and this, this opportunism, his ability to see opportunity and taking risks to capitalize on them continues the rest of his life. Uh, he gets to Montana and even though he has a fifth grade education, he just puts his head down and starts working and literally everything they touch turns to gold. So that was the part of the story that I had to explain. What was this metamorphosis that Emil went through that we don't understand? And Bill said, you know, he had to have met someone in that camp, someone who gave him hope that he could survive because my dad didn't talk about it. He he would very rarely talk about the camp because it obviously pained him. Um, but he did describe in detail how he escaped. And that was great because I, I was able to use it. So how does he make the metamorphosis? And I knew there was a person. And then while I was researching the book, I was in a place called Barlad, Romania, which the Martels went through in their, you know, their version of a Conestoga wagon being pulled by two horses, caught between the Soviet army and the German army, trying to get back to Germany, uh, not back, but to Germany for the first time. They were ethnic Germans who had lived in Ukraine for over 100 years. Uh, and they're being protected by the Germans because Heinrich Himmler believes these ethnic Germans who largely lived in isolation uh, in Russia were the last true source of pure Aryan blood. They don't know this at the time. This comes out as they're moving. Um, but I meet this guy when I go to Barlad where they went through, uh, and he was 98 years old when I met him, and he was one of the last survivors of Stalingrad. And he remembered distinctly the ethnic German um, trek, as they called it. There was roughly 100,000 people in these uh, carts, pushing carts in Conestoga wagons, what have you, moving um, at, you know, like a caterpillar's pace across uh, Eastern Europe, trying to get away from the Soviets. And he was one of the more enlightened people I've ever met. He had fought at Stalingrad. He survived. He came back. He was in Barlad when the ethnic Germans came through. And then he surrendered to the Soviets only to have them throw him into a prison camp where he escaped three times before he was put in a high security one. And he spent four years in one of these camps and survived by clinging to his dream of becoming a beekeeper. And it so impressed me the way he talked about it and then the way he beamed when he talked about bees and he, I just knew he was going to be the person who taught Emil. It's entire fictional, um, but it explains his transformation. And the Martells love the story, as I told it. Authors, I have a fantastic new service to tell you about. It's called PubSite. PubSite is a service to help you build your very own website, your home on the web, where you can promote your work and give your fans a place to connect with you. PubSite is a website platform that allows every author, regardless of budget, to have a great-looking professional website. Developed by the book marketing professionals at FSB Associates, PubSite is the new easy-to-use DIY website builder developed specifically for books and authors. Whether you're an author of one book or 20, or a small publisher, PubSite allows you to build, design, and most importantly, update your website pain-free. No need to be dependent on a designer or webmaster to make a small but costly change to your website. Save the money and do it yourself. PubSite is the best platform for authors because it's a book-centric platform. PubSite was built just for authors and small publishers. Every design, feature, and layout is book-centric. They have customized designs for you to use. It's easy to build. No coding or HTML is necessary to create a stunning, professional-looking website with all the features you want. Get a custom domain name, yourname.com. It's simple to update. You can add all of your books, add a blog and a book tour, sell from any retailer, manage your email list and social media, and even do e-commerce. Build your website with a 14-day free trial. 
then pay just $19.99 per month, which includes hosting. And we offer packages starting at $499 to set up the website for you. Pub-Site.com, the place to help authors find their home on the web. So, Mark, when um, if you're writing a thriller, um, you know that there are certain story aspects that you're playing with. You 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 have a mystery, and you have um, you know characters that that weave in and out of that mystery, and you have um, you know certain points that you're writing towards so that you get a, a a particular reaction from the reader, and then you know maybe misdirection, and then you know you're planting seeds along the way, and that there's kind of a there's a process to writing a, a thriller, you know, whether you want to think of it that way or not. There's, you know, there's there's a framework that that kind of makes up that sort of story. But when you're dealing with a story like The Last Green Valley, where there are things that you do know that are factual, these things actually happened, and then there are holes in the story, there are gaps that need to be filled in. Um, how do you start conceptualizing? The book. How how does it lay out in your mind or, or on paper, so that you kind of get a uh, a, a direction of where you're going? Sure. Um, well, first of all, I'm, I was lucky uh, with the Last Green Valley in that the story pretty much laid out along the trail of the journey that they took. So I was able to lay that out structurally. Now. While I was researching, um, and this is something I've come to believe over years, I found some things or read about ethnic Germans in Ukraine that were deeply troubling. Some of them willingly participated in the Holocaust. Um, others of them later claimed after they had been you know, ex- executioners that they only buried Jews. And when one of uh, Emil and Adeline's grandchildren told me that Adeline said that shortly after they were given their land back by the Germans after Hitler invaded, he went to a town nearby to buy roofing um, supplies. He was supposed to be back in a day and a half. He comes back four days later as rattled as she'd ever seen him. And he said he didn't want to talk about it, but he'd been held by the Nazis and forced to bury Jews. So I'm going, oh, my God. And um, at first I was like really disturbed by this idea. But then after I'd done enough research at the U.S. Holocaust Museum and through Yad Vashem, I was able to you know, unequivocally prove that the Martells had nothing to do with you know, anything in, in that area um, or anywhere else in Europe. So the more I read, the more about these ethnic Germans who collaborated, um, I also found out that. Um, the Holocaust or the final solution really starts in the Ukraine. It's that the Russians, I'm sorry, the, the Nazis invade, and then right behind them come these groups called the Einsatzgruppen, and they're the original executioners. And two weeks before they were sent in or before the invasion, Heinrich Himmler um, has a bunch of political prisoners shot in the way that the Einsatzgruppen will kill the Jews. And he gets so revolted, he vomits. And he says that no person shall be punished for refusing to kill a Jew. He wants true believers. In fact, during the Nuremberg trials, a number of members of the Einsatzgruppen tried to claim that they were forced to kill Jews. And um, when their lawyers went out trying to find an example of someone who was murdered because they refused to murder Jews, they were completely unsuccessful. And I thought that was fascinating. And it set up this deep moral subplot in the story, in in Emile's story. And who is he going to be? Who is he going to become in the course of the story? And that subplot, you know, really is the mystery of what drives Emile. Because when we meet him, at the beginning of the story, he has lost his faith in God. He doesn't believe it and because he's gone through this experience. And his wife doesn't know. And his wife is full of faith at the beginning, and she loses it when they're separated. Um, so I just thought that this whole idea of 
faith and the original days of the Holocaust were an absolutely fertile thing. So rather than avoid the issue, I faced it dead on. And because of it, the drama of that backstory just went through the roof. Mark, I was uh, I was at my daughter's uh, house over the weekend and we watched a movie um, on HBO Max or something. Uh, it was uh, The Zookeeper's Wife, I think it was called. Um, yeah. And it was it was a story about um, in Poland, uh, how they were invaded by the Nazis and, and how, uh, you know, this this family that owned the zoo, uh, can, you know, what their life was like. And they, they eventually um wound up hiding a, a lot of Jews in the zoo and and you know it was the story of how they they went all the way through the war and uh and only a, a couple of people were discovered and it was this this really you know heartwarming story and then you've got the um the Polish resistance that happens in it and and it, it kind of swells to the end and uh you know as as the Nazis are are kind of uh you know tucking their tail and, and running in a lot of ways but I couldn't help but think that um, e- even after this great uprising and uh, and defeat, then the Russians came in, and uh, you know Poland had another, gosh, forty years of uh, of of uh, you know life under the Russians, and they went from one bad situation to another bad situation, and um, I couldn't help but thinking about that when I was thinking about the last Green Valley and the the. Um, the idea of, of the Martels being stuck between these two powers that, uh, you know, there, there seems like there's there's no good way out. Uh, you know, either side is, uh, is is is, you know, death and doom. And um, I can only imagine what, you know, as you're writing the book and, and kind of walking in the Martel shoes and in these characters that uh, you know, the feeling of of desolation and desperation just must have been overwhelming. I I think it was, you know, right at the beginning of the story, they're faced with a horrible decision. Do they stay and wait for the Soviet bear to return or do they run with the wolves, the Nazis they've come to despise? And they decided to run with the wolves because the Nazis are going to protect them. They believe they're valuable. But Mr. Martel's entire, um, his entire goal was to get the freedom. And he knew that Germany wasn't freedom. He knew that freedom was with the Western allies. And so he, he, his entire vision was to get to the Western allied lines and not be there when the Soviets came in behind them. It's such an incredible story, Mark. Um, when when you shared the story with the family, um, what was I, I know that you said that that they they liked some of the the decisions that you made. Um, what what was their their overall reaction to the story? You know, that it's not often that we get to write a book like this and then have actual people that are connected to the story that we get to share that with. What, what was that experience like? Um, it was actually really good. I, I had become friends with uh, Bill and Walter, and I traveled with them to Ukraine. We, we tracked down the ruins of the farm where uh, the book begins, and to be with them and see the entire arc of their life play out before them was simply remarkable. Um, and then sh- actually getting the story down on paper and showing it to them I had some trepidation, but I knew I was really close. And even in the first couple drafts, I knew that I had told the story well and that I had stuck to what they had described, you know, from what they could remember and from what Emil and Adeline described in the recordings that I was able to listen to. Um, Bill read it in a matter of days and called me up basically crying that he said he he understood at some level how courageous and formidable his parents were, but until he read it and relived it, it, it didn't hit him, you know, and especially his mother. He just said, you know, the amount of courage it took for that woman to do what she did um, to run with us crossing out of the Soviet controlled sector to the British sector um, is simply remarkable. And he said, I, I'm so happy that my grandchildren will get to read this. Uh, And Walter, with just a couple of 
Um, Walter's more the engineering type. He's an architect. He, he's very numbers oriented. So he caught, you know, a lot of my mistakes in terms of times and dates and stuff. But he loved it, too. And so I'm very pleased about it. I have the full support of the Martell family at this point. That is fantastic. You, you couldn't ask for anything more than that. Um, Mark, uh, the last Green Valley is coming out almost four years to the day uh, from when yeah. Beneath the Scarlet Sky came out. Um, sure. Congratulations on that on the book launch, by the way. Thank you. Um, I, it's been four years um, since you had a book come out, and you know yeah. the 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 state of publishing as it is that. You know, we we really want authors to you know publish a book a year and to keep yeah. the machine rolling and all of that. Um, uh, you know, what what was your experience like? Of work uh, and obviously you needed this amount of time for this book. It, it shows on every page that the care uh, that you've taken with it. But uh, you, you know, was was there ever any uh, any any push to to you know hurry up and bring the book out? No, they're quite quite the opposite. They wanted me to nail it, which was great. Um, and it's great. It was great. And because they knew that this kind of book just cannot be done in a year. I mean, in even two years is pushing it. it. I turned it in, you know, about two, about a year ago, year and a half ago. Uh, and we worked on it for, you know, another eight months, just constantly going over it and developing and, and fixing stuff and, and amplifying things. And what I found over the years is that certain books take a certain amount of time beneath took me 10 years in my spare time um, this one took me four uh, actually to write it took me about to research and write it took me about two and a half um, and i was working on other projects and i continue to work with um, james patterson as a, an editor behind the scenes and stuff and so i i had work to do um, but I was given the time and the space to do it right. And I'm so grateful for it. I just know the story wouldn't have had the impact that it has um, if I had given it short shrift. And I wasn't going to do that. Not with this book. And I, I'm glad I'm glad you 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 didn't. Um, if you love Beneath a Scarlet Sky, and I know a, a, a bajillion people out there have loved it and bought it, and um, what a phenomenal success that book has been. Um, the Last Green Valley is a must buy. Uh, you know, you uh, I, I'm trusting that listeners have gone out and clicked on Amazon you know, while listening to the show and and purchased the last Green Valley. Um, we're going to put links to it in the show notes. Um, it, it's, uh, you know, whether you like to hold paper in your hand and read it or Kindle. And I, I'm assuming that the audiobook is going to launch also. Uh, I forgot day. to look. Same day. Yeah, that's phenomenal. Um Mark, we're going to put links to the, in, in the show notes where people can grab it. Um, if if people want to dig into all the great stuff that you do, I know that you have a phenomenal website. Uh, where can people find you? That's uh, MarkSullivanBooks.com. Excellent. We'll put links there as well. Uh, Mark, thank you so much for taking time to come back on the show. I love the new book. We're sending everyone to grab a copy of it. Thanks so much, Hank. I really appreciate your time. Authors, if you're looking for a partner to help ensure that your book is the best it can possibly be, look no farther than Pico's House. Crystal and her staff make a conscious effort to be critical yet courteous. They also strive to make the business side of things run smoothly so that you can rest easy knowing that your manuscript is in capable hands. Whether you need beta reading, developmental editing, a manuscript critique, line editing, copy editing or proofreading Pico's House is the one stop shop for you. Check them out today at picoshouse.com to get started.